What is up everyone, Josh White here, and this is a very special episode because Black Rifle Coffee Company were so kind and generous to let me use my new in-person live podcasting equipment in their store in Niceville, Florida. So I sat down with Mike Rosa in person and we got after it, y'all. We talked about failing. We both showed up here to Florida with goals and dreams. We've been friends for a long time. We got here together and we both failed miserably. How did we handle it? What would we change? What would we tell our past selves? You're gonna learn a lot about failing and how to handle it appropriately and how not to handle it on this live episode at Black Rifle Coffee Company. Hopefully we have more episodes like this going forward to learn all about these local veterans that we have that we can highlight at Black Rifle Coffee Company. It's gonna be a blast. I can't wait. I'm super excited about this. Watch it on the Spotify app because I actually post the entire video, the live video in its entirety. You could also find it on YouTube. All right, let's get after it. I am here with my best friend, Mike Rosa, who's stationed here at Whiteman or at Eglin with me and was stationed at Whiteman. And he's kind of a local celebrity. So everybody, if you could just give him a round of applause. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you, everybody. That's enough. That's enough. (laughs) I didn't tell you about that, did I? No. (laughs) I should have. I should have been prepared though for that. But yeah, I, I, this could sound like hot garbage for all I know. I have no idea. You'll see soon enough. Yeah. All right, man. So we're here. We've got the whole coffee store to ourselves. Right. We're talking. We're in person. We haven't seen each other in a while. Mm-hmm. First topic, I think, should be failure. Mm. If there's one thing your boy is good at, Bro, it's failing. That's me. Oh, yeah? You think, are you the boy? I thought I was the boy. (laughs) I was going to agree with you. Bro, failing? Yeah. Let me get on that fail. Let me get on that fail army. Yeah. Of life. Why do you think that? So, you know, back when we were at Whiteman, we came here with a purpose, with a plan. We were going to come to Eglin and we were going to kick ass take over the world we're gonna take over the world we're gonna change the air force i felt this righteous purpose this clear path from the past few years so many doors have opened and i just felt like i knew what i needed to do Mm -hmm. and i for once in my life believed that i could do it and that all fell to pieces once i got here and what breaks my heart even more was that it happened to you too and out of the two of us if i could pick one person to succeed i would want to see you succeed always that's how it works yeah like you're my boy and so seeing you struggle that that sucked that that made it kind of hit even harder you know what i mean right yeah so i was hoping you could just run me through like what your intent was coming here to eglin and what happened Right. Um, yeah, so I think you, I might have found out before you did or you found out before I did that you were coming here or I was going here. I think I found out first. Yeah, because you had actual orders and mine, um, I knew the school was here. So at the point when I started the cross training, I actually went for my interview for EOD um, where you have to go to the flight and you have to do your two weeks shadowing and they have to like basically interview you. Um, I did that when coronavirus just started, March of 2000 and was it 20? Yeah. So that's when it started. I was able to do my two weeks interview right before the Air Force started cracking down on coronavirus policy, like the HEPCON levels. So I was lucky to get that done and knocked out before all of the delays and all the in-person this and that got restricted um so that's when i kind of like started getting exposed to the process and where things were and i knew like geographically this would be where i would be if i passed the process the screening the preliminary school and all that stuff so um i never was really one like one to just assume that i'm going to pass something so i never 
I was happy to, to be here if I got here, and I didn't expect to come to Eglin because that meant I passed prelim school, which is not a very high pass rate. So um, it wasn't really like, oh, I'm going to be there. We're going to be fucking taking over the world and, you know, doing this just because, like, I didn't want to get my hopes up and I wanted, like, to stay sharp and stuff like that. So, um, but I did find out I was coming, obviously, after I passed that. And it's pretty cool to find out you're coming to Florida when you've been in Missouri for <laughs> four years or whatever it was. Right. So Florida was pretty cool. I got here in November, though. We got here, I don't know, you got here a little bit after me. Um, but mm -hmm. the weather wasn't, you know, Florida weather. And this is barely Florida. It Destin, is. Destin, Florida is Florida-Bama, which is basically you share Alabama's weather, I feel like. But you get the good parts of Florida. Right. You get Destin and Okaloosa. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. Yeah. So... Um, I love it. I'm from Ohio, so it gets super cold. You're from D.C., right? That's where you're yep, from? Yeah, Maryland, D.C., Virginia area. So it gets cold. But Ooh. granted, I haven't lived there for 17 years. Fair. <laughs> um, but just not the weather not getting cold enough to not produce snow and ice on your car and stuff like that is perfect for <clears> me. <throat> so it gets cold enough so I can wear this type of stuff and jackets here, but I don't have to wake up early to get snow off my car so that was pretty cool um but yeah so i got here and uh i had a class date of like october and just kind of prepped six months i had to wait to get in to the actual class so uh, it was just six months of doing details and showing up and doing pt and doing like your just straight accountability type stuff so um didn't really know what to expect obviously and the whole the whole way i don't know with that with this type of school you know like with your high washout schools and like courses and stuff is this you don't take it for granted if you're smart at least like if you actually are self-aware and present of what you're doing and the chances this that and the other but i guess like deep down i've never been one and you know you might well at this point now you've you said you've come across failure but before maybe some of those things you might kind of relate when you say like if i put my mind to something there's nothing i couldn't do before mm -hmm. you know like no course no mm -hmm. test of like strength of this that or the other that i haven't like been top like notch at it. um so there was really nothing for me to assume otherwise that I wasn't going to be at least top notch. Like I just passed the prelim course, which was really tough. That was like 27 people. Only nine of us went through, you know, and I was one of the nine. It's just like, it's in my storyline for me to always make it up until this point. Yeah. So that, that, that was there, but I also knew that I could show up one day and, you know, mess up something and then fail just like everybody else could fail. So it was like a mixture, like there's a recipe of like how I was thinking and like my attitude and posture and that's kind of how it was. Um, but started rolling, I mean, I got like six months into like the eight month course. So by that point, you kind of feel like you're there. Um, you've passed the, the humps of where that people within that, you know, community in the pipeline say like, these are the humps you got to get past. Um, so, you know, you kind of let off a little bit some of the steam. Um, but, yeah, uh, I got to pretty much pretty much the last commonly failable test. If you do fail, that's one of the ones you fail at. Um, and I failed it three times and then got separated from the program. And then got PCA'd, technically. Got stationed here at Eglin. So, so you were... Muns. I was previously Muns, yeah, ammo, for um, Whiteman, which is a very simpler base than Eglin. But yeah, so back to my old career field because I've I've been in for for anybody that doesn't know this, I gotta remember that people don't even know who I am. <laughs> you know, if you're listening to this, um, you know, people can go through the EOD program right out of high school. They go to basic training, they do their delayed entry program, they do their prep work with their, uh, usually it's the T3I trainers that do their like physical prep. Uh, and then they just go straight into the pipeline. For me, I did basic training, tech school for months, was in my career field for about four years-ish, 
uh, then decided to cross train and um, yeah, that's where the story just came from. So I was a prior service retraining. Gotcha. Oh my gosh, man, your your tech school journey was so intense. EOD, mm-hmm. like they're working you out every single day. You had to wait forever just to start. Yeah, that was pretty rough. Um, it was absolutely brutal tech school. While this is going on with you, I'm basically having the worst time of my life. Which you've hinted at a couple times when we talked. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I hinted at it, yeah. It, it progressively got worse. Um, and I'm not going to go into all the details of that, but I'll just say I was going through the worst career experience that I've ever had, I, I will say. Which is a lot to say. Yeah, and, I, and I've been age. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that is true. Um, but it, it was very, very difficult for me here, um, and I hit an all-time low psychologically. started questioning my self-worth, started questioning my purpose, Mm-hmm. You know, I felt like I was on this righteous path to be a part of the Air Force for 30 years and, and do all this change like the leaders that we got to meet. Um, mm-hmm. I thought that was going to be us. And so when that started to slip, you know, from my fingers, it was very, I was basically like, it was like losing a friend. You know what I mean? Like when when that goal, when that dream escapes and, and you have to face the fact that that plan is not happening anymore you kind of like have remorse for it you know what i mean you kind of mourn for her and so for a time i was very very low because i'm not that guy anymore you know what i mean but that's not me here and and it was very very hard to cope with and then once i found out you didn't make it through eod i was just like i was already at my lowest point and then hearing that just brought me lower because I just wanted you to succeed so bad. Right. Like, he, if I don't, at least he does. Yeah. Yeah. And so when, when we both didn't, it just had me really questioning, like, my purpose. Mm-hmm. <laughs> when I When I was convinced we were sent here for a reason. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I guess, I guess maybe, like, weird foreshadowings. That's why. Because... I don't know. This is definitely the first time I've, like, major failed, I'd say, in my life. There's been some other times where I've had, like, some obstacles and, like, things in my way. Um, But I've never been a fan of, like, expecting something or, like, preparing for something that just kind of, like, happened. Um, You know, I've had some rough, like, years with my, like, parents. So, like, my dad was never in my life and, like, came in and out, like, randomly. And, like, that kind of taught me at a very early age. Um, to just not expect because I just expected like when they said something or they said they were going to do something like my dad would just show up and do this that and the other um, and then like just poof and be gone you know what I mean so Mm -hmm. like from then on I noticed like just being self aware of some things um, I noticed that I I don't like to expect certain things so um, I wasn't too committed to anything emotionally so it hit me hard but I guess deep down is like I kind of expected something bad to happen. You know when you like you're 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 pacing and you're like ah something this is too good to be true like something's not there. It's like lingering. You know what I mean? At least I hate that you feel like that. Uh, like that's not that's not normal. That's not normal. (laughs) I'm just always cautious. I want to make sure that I'm not like blindsided. At least you know. Like I always like to be prepared um, for you know for some things to happen because I feel like when all the bad things happen it's when you least expect them or you weren't prepared for that to happen you know what I mean like something happens and you're like oh my god I had no idea that that was even an option of happening so I like to try and like be super aware and just know all the possible options even if they're if they're not in my favor gotcha Um, but as far as like the purpose goes it's funny because towards the last month that I was at the school I was thinking in my head like you know it's very At that point, you've seen so many people that are, like, super sharp, like, Army lieutenants, uh, freaking 12-year Army, you know, staff sergeants, like, go through this course, Marines that are, like, super sharp, fail out, and they just get dropped, and you're just like, like, I'm not, I'm not any better than that person. Like, if anything, they're probably way more sharp than I am, you know what I mean? So, like, 
you don't take it for granted that you're there and you know damn well that that could be you so you're kind of postured towards like if i get like you just think through it and you know i'm like well what if it does happen like what if i do get dropped you know like how will i feel you know because like right now i'm super committed to pursuing this journey that i have set like in front of me and i just thought it was funny that i was like hmm. it's i was like maybe it's not healthy that i'm ba- like i'm basing my own mental health and self worth off of me making it in the EOD because I was like if I'm not happy right and I make EOD like what does that do for me you know what I mean okay I'm EOD now Mm -hmm. I still have the same morals I still have the same ethics I still am the same person Mm. I still evaluate decisions the same I just am doing I'm fulfilling a different duty you know so maybe it's not like maybe it's not as much as I joked myself or I you know made it out to be something that maybe it's not because you know you're always chasing something like there's something somebody's Mm -hmm. always chasing in their life and sometimes you just gotta ask yourself like okay what if I get it what if I got what I think that I really want tomorrow then what like what does it really do for Mm -hmm. you I think uh, we get we often get caught up in titles or accomplishments as Mm -hmm. benchmarks uh, at least for me yeah so for a time like I was going for for master sergeant because I felt like if I could make master sergeant then that would mean yeah. I'm good like it's, it does something right like that's validation to me right that that's a good word that's what I was looking for that I don't suck mm-hmm. and in reality it should not take that right you know what I mean I mean it's a it's okay to want those things and you could use them it's a, it's a, it's a difference it's like a, you know it's ingredients you know what I mean it, it can be a part of the ingredients but it shouldn't be mm-hmm. the whole the only ingredient you know right. and I think that's when it becomes unhealthy is when we invest too much of our self worth and self image in things that we think you know, are going to give us that you know yeah that, if there's one thing I learned from falling flat on my face here would be I put all my eggs in one basket right and that is not good um I I didn't have a plan B I just had plan A kick ass change change the air force change the world right (laughs) and just do as much good as I can I never considered any other option and so I failed with that with that mindset and I also failed with just caring too much what people thought I mean really I, 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 I kind of showed up vulnerable mm-hmm. and worried and self-conscious and so that you know when I was met with criticism and toxicity I was already vulnerable and I, I got really tied up probably the dude let it eat at you you think yeah I, I got really tied up with like my identity what I'm capable of my worth I started questioning it and I started caring way too once you start once you get in that rabbit hole of like people pleasing and trying and like really caring what everyone's thinking Mm -hmm. you just make it 10 times worse right you know and i I think i got caught in that cycle pretty much right out the gate um and so those are the two things that i think if i could go back it would be to not care as much Yeah, that's a good let me ask you if you were to coach yourself before you leave eglin you know, you probably wouldn't tell yourself. I don't know. It's like if you have a, like a like a child that has the same dream as you. You don't want to tell them to not have that dream. Like that's not going to solve it, right? Because maybe twenty years from now, maybe you needed to learn what you learned. Yeah. You know, like not experiencing the whole situation might not be a complete pro. You know, so but what would you? I don't know. Coach yourself or like tell yourself now know mm-hmm. what you know before you left for Eglin would and would you well the first thing I would say is don't go <laughs> really <laughs> I would say find a, find a way to not go really uh, yes for sure um, but let's just say that's not on the table and okay. I have to go so if that's the case um, I would say be confident 
in who you are and what you're capable of, even when you're attacked. Right. Because you're, you're going to be attacked, especially when you're putting yourself out there. Um, so just to be rooted and confident in yourself and your abilities without needing the appra- appraisal of others, like mm-hmm. without people celebrating you. I kind of got used to that. That was pretty, pretty common. Yeah, if, if, I could, if I'm being transparent, before I got to Whiteman in general, I was never really in a good positive light. I was kind of always just in the middle. Mm-hmm. And I got very accustomed to being recognized, to being included, to being seen, being heard, being appreciated, and people believing in me. And that became my norm. And so I would tell myself, that's not always gonna be the norm, and when it's not the norm, don't let it break you. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty big. And that, I mean, I guess that's the same for me, because at the time, I mean, I'm pretty new to the military, so the honor guard thing and all that stuff we were doing, the high vis stuff, and. I mean, Chief was this, like, Chief Timmerman, you know? She was super... Po- and there were just a lot of positive people in our corner, I think. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Like, that was a really good team. Just people that wanted to see you do well. And, you know, what I noticed about EOD and what solidified that, one of the thing I don't know, if, like, the words I'm looking for are the best words that kind of suit what I'm feeling, but what validated, like, why I wanted to go to that career field was... None of the people that I met along the way, the tech sergeants that have been in for 16 years that have deployed to Afghanistan and Iraq and like all of these really like shitty times, like when when the IED, like the war on IEDs and like counter IED mission, like all that was happening, Mm -hmm. like they were in that. Right. So if anybody has the room or the credentials to to shit talk somebody or to, to, I don't know put their you know credentials against somebody else right it's them Mm -hmm. but none of that like they were the most humble people they just you know i'd ask them questions coming from somebody like me like i was just a muns dude you know in their work center asking them questions assuming that i'm going to be one of them you know and you would think the territorial part of them would come out and be like well who is this dude you know you're not one of us you won't be one of us probably you know what i mean like Mm -hmm. you would expect to at least see that or sense that um there was none of it. It was literally only people trying to give me advice that they wish they would have known to, to give me a better chance to make it. Like they, they, in their eyes, they respect what they were doing and they had open arms to anybody who wanted to come into what they were doing and help it be a good member in addition to it to help the community, like anything. So like leaders like that, I think, for whatever reason, Whiteman Adam, they were around um and yeah i guess we got a little too accustomed to that feeling so what do you think it comes from when like you're in an organization where that's not a priority i mean they might say it is right but they're not actually acting on it um as far as like a like a, a like investing in people right to you know make things better in the long run um, I think I was, I was just having a conversation about this. Um, I don't know. See, I have a lot of beliefs. Um, and one is I definitely believe in people. I don't, I don't really think people are bad, you know, because a lot of people will just say it's the leaders, right? The leaders of the organization are bad, and then it trickles down from that. Like, the leaders don't care in this. But, like, the leaders, right, quote, unquote, the leaders, that's one of us. Like, we're, I'm going to be a leader one day. Like, you're a leader. You know, somebody right now thinks that you're the problem. And that's just not the case. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know exactly what happens, um, you know, from what I see as far as the places that I've been in. Um, it seems like there's just a bunch of, of faith loss, right? Because people come in with the drive. And I see this with uh, the airmen I just got. Because like, now I have three airmen under me, senior airmen. And I'm getting to a work center where I see, you know, some of the morale not be where I think it it should be and it could be. Um, And I think it comes from just the lack of faith that you have the support and the, like, reinforcement that 
your opinions matter. You know what I mean? Like you can say something and it's important to you and then it will be important to the people around you and like your leaders. And I just think people don't realize the importance of that when they get, because the only thing that makes like in a work center, a tech sergeant to a master sergeant to a staff sergeant is just time and service. Like you never really have to learn like how to be a better person. Like you can just do your job, do it well, and do certain things in school and stuff like that. And you can become whatever rank you want to be. I know there's certain you know limitations to that, but I just think people don't develop themselves. Um, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that, or that person's less of a person than another person. It's just I just think you start seeing problems when there's people that are relying on them for validation and reinforcement, and they don't even know that that's happening. Right? They say, I want to see, I think this and this is the problem here. And then instantly, like, they just shut it down. Like, because socially, they don't understand, like, the social cue of, like, oh, that person, you know, even if we're not going to go through with this idea, like, me supporting their idea and, like, saying that's a good idea and, like, thanking them for, like, bringing it up. Like, all these things that, like, they could do, they don't do. And then, you know, that person starts thinking in their head, like, why? Like, why is it even, like, why am I going to go through the problems and struggles of trying to go above and beyond? finding how to like maybe improve processes or doing other people's work when I don't have to like because it it hurts like as much as people don't want to admit it hurts to put your hand out there and get it slapped you know to get burned and that only can happen so many times for people where they just stop caring you know and sometimes that carries with people and then that's how they think things go and it's just like a bad like non-reinforcement of just like having a good time while being the best you know that's like very possible and not a lot of people try to adopt that i don't think yeah man um i've been in the work center like with major cunningham and chief timmerman where they absolutely like fostered that yeah like they invested in people they went above and beyond they let they let us have creative control mm-hmm which I thought was huge. So they, they were a little they were risk takers in a way, because not many people relinquish that kind of creative control. They no. say, hey, these are your lanes and that's it. And then we said, well, what about like what if we shifted that lane or, or went outside the lane? Mm-hmm. And they'd say, well, you know, sell it to me, and I would, and they'd say, let's do it. And that's that's kind of rare. I think that's very rare. <laughs> I think I think it takes a a very it takes a person that has no insecurities to have somebody not of their rank right not of their authority come up to them and present them with an idea that's not theirs that would now dictate how things go for them to be like okay i'll listen to it and not only will i listen to it i'll accept it if it makes sense rather than that's not my idea and so i don't want it you know what i mean yeah and maybe like I said, people don't grow as a, as a person and they're at that point where they need to establish the dominance to make themselves feel a certain way. So that means any idea that's not mine is not going to go. <laughs> so right. I think we got, you know, we were shown the type of people that have nothing to prove to anybody. You know, they know, they know who they are. They, they know that people have good ideas and they know that if we present them an idea, right, to change something, it's not in the in the sense that we don't like their idea. We just have a sense that, like, this could be better. Mm. You know, it's like listening to the wrong mm-hmm. message. Mm-hmm. It's like listen to the message of, I'm here to help, rather than, your way sucks. And we kind of ran into that your way sucks with another scenario. Uh-oh. Actually, now that you mention it, if you remember, we were looking to fix, like, we were on a roll. We were looking to fix yeah, anything yeah, anything whatever. that we came in, in touch with. <laughs> yeah. We were going to make it better. And so we just took the green belt training right. and we wanted we needed a project to work on. Yeah. And everyone unanimously hated AADD. Mm. Right. Right. So basically it's this alcohol like this drunk driving Aaron prevention drunk driving. Yeah, it's a it's a drunk driving prevention where if I'm drinking and let's say my plans fall through and I'm faced with driving home or walking, etc., I could call this number and there's someone on standby who would come and pick me up to prevent me from drinking and driving. 
Mm -hmm. And unanimously across the base, it was not doing great for some reason. DUIs were spiking. High. Right. We we were. It was a major problem. Well, just to give the setting, it's in Missouri, in the middle of nowhere. And ten minutes away is a strip of bars. It's about the highlight of what you had to do. So, with context, I mean. And there's only so many roads. Like the there's cops, only so many. Yeah. yeah, like if you do it, you have a high chance of getting caught there. Yeah. Um, no, so there absolutely. were contributing factors, but. Yeah. So, but that's a that's a good example of like when we had all these good ideas and we brought it to the officer that was in charge of the program and without even hearing us shut it down right in a sense of just like very defensive like like uh, that person felt that it was more of an attack on how inadequate she was doing at her job rather than hey we noticed that this is an important like program and we want to try to improve it like two different things right Mm -hmm. she didn't see it as that she saw it as they think that i've been doing my job right as the the leader of this program poorly and that this is why i suck that's basically what she what she thought she saw it as an attack super super defensive you know and i was like dang like so defensive that it was like very clear that we needed to stop (laughs) yeah coming to just her wasn't, yeah. with ideas just wasn't yeah it wasn't going so anywhere. so that's a good example of the opposite end of the spectrum right yeah when someone here when you come to them with just pure intention of making something better mm-hmm. and they take it as an attack right on that's how, crazy on how they've been doing something yeah and i forgot i had a I had something on the top of my head but but basically because it goes it goes both ways with that um but I think ultimately that drove a lot of the morale in like the work center is you know how much faith do you have that your that your leaders can like listen to you like that can hear what you have to say and not go oh what I was going to say is um, uh, the micromanaging I think you brought it up or you hinted at it at some mm-hmm. point um, but that's a big one too not only like do they not necessarily think that my ideas have any value or like support or reinforce my ideas but we'll take my ideas and then that's their project like they have their hands all in it along the way like mm-hmm. giving you the creative room to do your own thing mm-hmm. and then not having to control it and make it theirs like that takes a lot of self-growth i thought the most impressive thing when i joined the military was how much trust some of these leaders have with people like i have to do everything myself that's how i was right like if mm-hmm. i didn't do it myself i didn't trust it to get done right so to see like tech sergeants and master sergeants sit down and give a project to somebody like of high importance like a general is coming and you have to brief a four star general on this thing Mm -hmm. make sure it gets done i'm just like i would be sweating i would be dying not (laughs) doing everything myself like opening that door making sure the floors are swept making sure this you know right they just give that trust you know they they have faith that and i think it comes from training like you have to train your people to Mm -hmm. a point uh, you know, imply the, the expectations and standards and, like, kind of get that feel. But once you develop or you know that they're at that point, then just give them the ability to, like, do their thing. Yeah. That's tough, I think, to do. And I don't think a lot of people are, are at that point, and it's, it's pretty obvious. Definitely. They might not realize it, but everybody else realizes it around them. Yeah, man. That's very, very good insight. And that insight. destroys... Um, Morale, not morale. I think morale is like a cover-all statement, but you know what I mean. Like, airmen, it destroys like innovation. Innovation, and like you said, they're got, they got. That's basically a form of them getting their hands slapped and not wanting to, yeah, to do that again or take that on because they're like, uh, like, why would I? Right, it's just not worth it. It's just not worth it. Um, okay, so let's hear what your plans are then. So what happened? You you washed out of EOD, right? And you're back in Munns, but now you're stationed at Eglin. They kind of absorbed you. <laughs> they absorbed me. And yeah. so I've never even asked you this. Yeah. What's next for you? What's your plans? What's your goals? Um, I know, like, recently, it was just to kind of uh, get by, you know? Because, um, like, I just got put on nights for the first time ever. So mm-hmm. pretty much recently it's just been keeping some discipline with like sleep schedule i mean because just getting up 
when you're tired all the time and just taking like showers brushing your teeth doing laundry like the simple stuff like keeping an actual routine it's kind of like what i'm working on and and just making sure because like obviously like it's probably no um surprises like my mental health took a hit with this obviously you know i invested uh, probably the most of myself that i've ever invested into this um and didn't get it so that's something that i had to come to terms with and that's a whole discussion in and of itself um but it's tough to move forward uh, or to get a plan from that because you don't know what you want like i don't know what i want to do um you know a lot of decisions have to be made and i'm the type of person that has to commit to something like spirit mind and body to something if i'm gonna like actually follow through with whatever so right now i'm just kind of um i'll say being a staff sergeant now in an operational base with like airmen and all that all of this stuff i'm learning I'm at a fighter base test base supporting five or six squadrons learning right now is like what i'm doing i'm absorbing all of this random shit being thrown at me constantly mm. uh, i just had to do three prs first prs i've ever done in my life you mm-hmm. know what i mean um so so far with the shift change with the trainings that i have to have done um being a new you know supervisor um kind of all this stuff just learning uh, I, I just know that no matter what i do moving forward um the only way i'm going to respect myself is that the the position that i hold currently um is being done at the best of my ability um so that's kind of like where i'm at now you know even if i don't plan on being a staff sergeant in months or tech or whatever i just tested for tech by the way if that oh nice blows your mind it does <laughs> yeah blows my mind too they told me i'm tech sergeant eligible and i was like why why am i tech sergeant eligible? you were just a senior I've been in the military for at least a year it feels like um but yeah even if this isn't where i'm going to be uh, there's no reason to not try and at least find out and understand what i need to do to be the best what i am now um at least you know i have my problems and this is by no means me saying that i'm trying to be the best person i've ever been in my life right now it's just at least aim in that direction you know really mm-hmm. put my you know nose to the grindstone with learning to be a good supervisor like that's at least what i can do now and right. we'll find out we'll find out what happens later you know where i end up and what happens um i mean I, you hear about people finding out their journeys really far into life yeah like what they want to do so i'm in no rush um you know uh but yeah that's kind of like what i'm doing what about you so <clears throat> original plan was 30 year command chief yeah right. uh that's out the window um and you know the podcast has has really opened my eyes to a lot of possibilities because i talk to people who are doing really amazing things right and yeah i want to i want to get in on that i'm excited about that and so where it really hit me was that that i'll probably retire at 20. when the moment that that hit me was when i applied um for a special duty here while here at eglin and it didn't and i didn't get picked Hell, I don't even think I was eligible. And it it absolutely crushed me because I knew I would be really good at this special duty. Now, the realization that I had was I want this job because it falls into my skill set and my strengths. It plays into my strengths, and I know I would be good at it. Was it recruiting? No, it was the uh, Airmen and Family Readiness Center NCO. Oh, really? Yeah. it's That's all civilians that work there, but there's one senior NCO who manages it essentially and it's a local hire right it is yes and so that's the that's the job i was counting on getting uh that or als commandant i don't think either one are going to work out um but once that first one fell through and it crushed me i thought why am i you know counting on this job that's so hard to get because think of all the people competing for it i i want this job so bad because i know i'd be good at it why not just retire at 20 and then do a job that I'd be good at? That would make me happy. That would play into my strengths. All right. Why not just do those things? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Instead of like pulling my hair out, competing for these one, once every four years slots. Yeah. I mean, you know, that the chances of me getting are like, 
I don't know, 10%. Right. So You don't have to have the stripes on in the job to do that job. Right, and I've talked to a lot of people who retired and they're, they're living their best life because they are able to find something that truly brings value and purpose to their life. Um, and so that was kind of my aha moment. Like, in, and I guess in the back of my mind, I hope that us coming here and failing is still part of the big plan. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? It is, it is if you make it. Yeah. You know, because your journey is there's only one person moving the feet in front of the other feet. Yeah. You know, that's you. So um, I definitely think your story like we've maybe even said to each other we don't want people on our team that have never seen the face of failure before that doesn't make a good teammate right it doesn't i wouldn't want them on my i mean okay sure they could be on my team but like you know what i mean yeah the they, person you, you have is, a different kind of perspective and caution about you when you've seen the good the bad and the ugly versus just the good yeah yeah builds character I think it does. You've you built a lot of character. Well, you think since so? I've met you, <laughs> yeah, I mean. astronomically amount. Oh my gosh, you've come so far. Me and my mom joke about it because it just seems like I just I can't I can't just be that person that just kind of moseys along like life and just like wiggles around and just does their thing. Like I just have to get this thrown at me and that thrown at me and this, and I'm just like, oh my god, I just got to deal with it. You know what I mean? Yeah. But you know I. I'm glad it's me and not somebody else, you know, because I think one of the gifts my mom gave me was to to be very self-aware and to be able to process these things. And she's really smart with that stuff. So I talk to her all the time. I have a good relationship with my mom, so and, I, and I'm thankful for that because being able to talk to somebody that actually gets you and cares for you, that's mm-hmm. helped me a lot through all these things. So, um, so as long as I have her, you know, yeah, and uh, that's helped me a lot. So. That's awesome. Can't take all the credit, you know. No, your mom is pretty incredible. Yeah. I've met her a few times now, and she is just a very special person. She said hi, by the way. Oh, awesome. <laughs> and Angie said hi, by the way. Okay. So, all right, man. We're going to wrap it up here because Black Rifle is about to close, uh, and they definitely don't want us here after no. 9 p.m. Um, so just trying to get out. Wrapping it up, do you have any final thoughts or words that you want to mm. share? Considering this was a kind of like off the hip type thing, yeah, not really. Um, on the topic of failure, I mean, to kind of conclude, just be careful on what you're investing. Uh, like eggs in the basket was a good way to put it. You know, you know, just be careful that you're investing too much of your self identity and self worth in degradable aspects in life, like position, money, cars. You know, because someone's like, opinion looks on social media. That's a big one too. You know, people think that because they look good or like they they have this image, mm-hmm. that it's a validation. But that's not going to be with you. You know, you could get in a car accident and not look the same the next day, or you, you know? could just age, or you can just age and gravity will win. <laughs> right. But just be careful. You know, be cautious of you know try and try and just be self-aware and, and self-analyze situations here and there and just think you know you know is it healthy that i'm putting this much you know attention into this and like if i don't get this i'm still a good person i can still help the person to my left and to my right you know and it doesn't take anything away you know if you if you get to where you want to go or you don't like everything you've done before is still done and accomplished you know Absolutely. so don't don't take that away from yourself It's funny I say that because I did, but yeah. Well, we all do, and that's why you have that perspective, because you you had all, to have all your eggs in one basket and then that plan fall through is, it's, you're kind of in too deep. Yeah. And you know it. Yeah. And when it doesn't work out, it it burns. It does hurt. Bad. And you will be unsure of who you are at that point. (laughs) Yeah. So, no, I think that's all very, very uh, great advice, man. So, I just want to thank you. Rosa for coming out here you know staying up late with us here at Black Rifle Coffee um, Absolutely. it's just really cool this is the first in person interview that I've done myself for my own brand so That's pretty to cool. do it with you and at Black Rifle you're my brother for life man I'm very proud of you um, for not giving up I mean 
I got my butt kicked here and wanted to quit. And I feel like you got your butt kicked a little worse because it was a, a more dramatic change with the pass or fail, right? Like right. passing, you you live life A. Yeah. Failing, you live life B. It's a very dramatic right. difference, right? And so I think you handled it, not perfect, obviously, but I, I'm proud of you of how you handled it, that you got here, you're still trying to help people, you're still trying to make a difference, you still care. Right. And I definitely admire that about you, and I'm proud of you, man. Thank you so much for hanging out with us tonight. Absolutely. All right, y'all. Well, we're cutting out of here before we get kicked out. Cheers. Cheers. All right. See you.